go ahead and get started. I'm very happy to have Rob Mercer here today from MathWorks. Rob is a development manager for Internet of Things applications uh, in MATLAB. He has expertise in the intersection of hardware and software, uh, and also expertise in marketing and project management. We're going to be talking about analysis and visualization techniques for uh, Internet of Things and environmental systems. Please welcome Rob. Hey everybody. So, I've actually seen this quote a few times now here in the presentations today. That you know, one of the things that McKinsey and Company tells us is that well, there's being a lot of there's a lot of data that's being collected in the Internet of Things, but not much of it is actually being analyzed. So we're going to spend a little time talking about some different analysis work that me and my team have done at MathWorks um, as we're developing a bunch of tools around Internet of Things and doing analytics associated with Internet of Things. Um, if you collect data but you don't analyze it, that actually has a negative return on investment. That means you spent money collecting the data, and then you put it on a hard drive somewhere, and you never looked at it again. Lots of people do that. Um, and it turns out that as difficult and as expensive it is actually to collect the data, you have to make sure that you invest and plan to invest almost as much or even more, perhaps, on analyzing the data that you collect. And it's actually really hard to create reliable, uh, real-time analytics that are actually trustworthy, that people will actually depend on. And so that's, a, that's something you've got to take time on to both create them and test them and make sure they're right. Whoops. Simulink is a design uh, environment, a graphical design environment for designing, originally it was made to design control systems. So, and you use Simulink today even though you don't know it. Because you travel in a vehicle, including the elevator, I suspect, that you used to ride up to this floor. The control systems in almost every, in, in every car, modern automobile, the anti-lock braking system, the, um, the shift and transmission systems, and engine control are all simulated and designed using our products. Um, and then the third product is called ThingSpeak, which is a Internet of Things data aggregator, a place to put your stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but this is essentially a web service that allows you to send data from your devices, from your Internet of Things devices, and then be able to access that from, uh, from different data analysis platforms. So think of this as a tour. We're going to take a tour of a bunch of different projects to highlight some of the things that go on in the Internet of Things and some of the places where you can do data analysis. We're going to go uh, visit a car, uh, we're going to use a weather station to walk through some of the pieces and parts. We're going to uh, look at a car counter that we have set up that actually counts cars that go by the MathWorks buildings in Route, uh, in Natick, uh, route 9. Go to sleep again, um, and um, we're going to uh, dive into some more in-depth analytics, looking at a at a noise analysis problem that we've been wrestling with, and then finally we're going to have a little bit of fun and not get caught in the mud 
uh, in a, using a, doing a tide prediction task and actually uh, generating data from tides. So let's talk about the, uh, the Internet of Things and the layout of the Internet of Things. So this is a fairly standard kind of diagram that we use to talk about the Internet of Things and the different components of it and where you do analytics in it. On the left-hand side, you'll see the uh, what we call the edge node, some device that's out in the world collecting data. That can be a very sophisticated device. It can be run into very sophisticated algorithms. But it's out in the world. It's usually a microprocessor device. And it's got some kind of internet connectivity. In our particular, uh, oops. In our particular example, right, this is our weather station. This is the actual piece of equipment that goes and measures the temperature and the wind, direct, wind speed direction and all that fun stuff. Second part is a data aggregator. Um, a data aggregator is some kind of thing, usually in the cloud, although it doesn't have to be. And it's a place to put your stuff. It's a place to put your data when you collect it. A lot of times it also has the ability to do visualizations, and um, it does uh, it, it does AMP online analytics. It analyzes the data, often provides what we might think of as situational awareness. What's going on right now? Sometimes even people call that now casting. Instead of forecasting, they call it now casting. Seeing what's going on right this minute. In our case, that's um, ThingSpeak. And one of the things that ThingSpeak can do is it can actually take the data that's being fed to it and provide real-time charting of that data. Um, and so that is the actual temperature in data at this moment, 76.7 or 8 degrees. Um, and so those, those plots actually update live. That plot adds a point every minute. Finally, a third part is what we would call exploratory analysis. And this is where you have all collected a bunch of data, and now you actually have to do the work to figure out what it means, gain some insights. In our case, our tool of choice for that is MapUp. Um, and it's a, it's a method where you're, you're, you have a lot of data, you now need to actually spend some time understanding it, and then take that information and develop algorithms and concepts from it. So for instance, here, here's a temperature analysis over the past year. Now, although the data typically flows through from the edge node to the data aggregator through to exploratory analysis, it turns out that when people actually do this work, the workflow that they follow is they usually develop the edge node first, the thing that's out in the world, they start collecting data, and then they do historical analytics. So they jump over to the exploratory analysis phase. They do that exploratory analysis, and once they've got some insights, then they take that and they actually feed that algorithm back into the aggregator to do online analytics, or out into the edge node to actually do the embedded analytics. So it's a little bit, uh, the, the, the workflow is slightly different than usual, than the way the data flows. But when they do that, that actually can generate uh, live analytics, live online analytics. So right now we're running, running a bunch of MATLAB code that generates a, a, a visualization online of the past, of what's happened today uh, for our weather station. We're just gonna move the cursor a little bit. So. Go sleep again. So again, right, we can generate these types of uh, online visualizations, a now state or a situational awareness type visualization of the data set that just came in. So let's transition. Let's start talking about counting cars, edge node stuff. So we're here at the edge node over on the left hand on the on the left hand side. And so our car counter is actually a Raspberry Pi and a webcam that are looking out the window of one of our buildings at the highway going by. And it's actually counting the cars that go by in each direction. And yes, that's live data from our car counter on uh, the number of cars going eastbound and westbound in the last 15 seconds. So how do we do it? So one of the things that goes on, that, that's happened in the, uh, in the embedded space is that mobile phones have come along. And one of the things that mobile phones have done is that unlike um, the desktop environment where the processor power that's available on a desktop or a laptop machine has essentially plateaued over the last five to six years. You go and buy a laptop today, 
it's basically kind of about the same processor power available to it as it had five years ago. It really hasn't been a huge amount of change there. However, in the embedded space, the amount of processor power that's available at a given power budget has, has increased enormously, and that's thanks to mobile phones. And so there are all sorts of algorithms which once upon a time we would only do on a desktop class machine that suddenly are available to embedded devices, things like machine learning, classification, um, machine vision, or general purpose machine vision, um, statistical modeling, and even small vocabulary voice recognition can all be done in a fairly low power environment nowadays. So, Let's talk a little bit about this. So we talked briefly about Simulink. And so this is the diagram of our uh, car counting system, the edge node, the things that go on in the edge node itself. There's a bunch of different steps. And we'll just walk quickly through some of them. So the first one is called foreground detection. This is a standard uh, technique in computer vision where you actually have, you, you were looking at a, at a video feed, and you quickly can figure out what's the background, what are the things that don't change, and what are the things that do change. And you can create what are called regions of interest. And that's what the green boxes are that you can see. That's basically, you can think of it as that's where the device has its attention. Uh, the second part is to do filtering and to try and decide what are objects and what are just noise. So the problem for a machine vision system is, right, there's a, there's a, a tree in the foreground there, and, and every time the leaves move, it sees that as, as motion. So there's a very technical term that computer science and computer vision people use for this. They call it blob analysis. So they're analyzing the blobs. And they're picking out which things are cars and which things are leaves. And so here, they've identified there's four different cars and they're moving in the picture. And from there, they can take that data and we can work out, okay, well this car's going eastbound, and this car's going westbound. And then we can send that data up what things need. And again, here's our live visualization of the cars. Looks like there's something going on on the westbound side of all the cars. So again, you can get a sense of these are the kinds of things that you can do in an embedded, um, an embedded system in an engine these days. So the key thing, right, is a lot of the algorithms that once upon a time we would have said have to be done in the cloud, have to really heavily require a lot of processor power, require a big iron. All of those things can actually be delegated down into the engine. So as you're designing an Internet of Things system, it's something to keep in mind that there may be quite a bit of processing that you can actually push up to the edge, even in fairly low power environments. So let's switch over and talk a little bit about historical analysis. So one of the tenets here is right that there are people who say, oh, all the processing is going to happen on the edge. All the processing is going to happen on the cloud. It's not true. It's going to happen in all sorts of different places. And, and every IoT system that we've built so far, we've found that it's everywhere. It's everywhere throughout the system. There are different levels of analytics available in every different form. So let's talk a little bit about exploratory analysis. So um, we have a noise problem. Uh, it's a residential area, but we have commercial buildings. And commercial buildings produce HVAC noise. And so, uh, we're helping out somebody who apparently their HVAC system isn't performing, isn't, isn't operating correctly, and they appear to need to move forward. You may get to enjoy the. Oh, no, I was quick enough that time. Um, there we go. Um, the, uh, so, with the residential HVAC systems, we're getting reports of late night, loud, sustained noises. So we have a system that's actually measuring the noise level, the median noise level uh, in this residential neighborhood and trying to find out events when they occur to correlate to different to other things that we know from data from the HVAC systems. And so this is the data that we collect. This is a week's worth of data that we collected um, of ambient noise levels throughout the, at, at nighttime. And that's the raw data. Kind of messy, a little hard to figure out what it is. Um, things do get quieter as the night goes by, generally, but that's what all you can tell. Well, the first thing we do is we apply a fairly standard technique called median filter. And that immediately cleans up the data. It immediately gives you much better insight into what's going on, and you can see much more clearly what's happening. It takes a lot of the noise out. 
we'll talk more about media and filters in a little bit. You take that data and overlay it night after night. Right? So every night, here's what the data looks like layered on top of each other. So all the you know, midnights all line up here. And one of the things you can see generally is that there's, there's a general pattern. And in fact, if you take the median of all the of all of each night, so take all the all the readings at eleven o'clock at night, take the median of those, you come up with the green line, which is a representation of about what we would expect to see given these seven days of data. We take that and we actually apply a, a, poly, a polynomial fit to it. We can actually put, oh, sorry, normalize it and then put a polynomial fit to it. Now we can see, now we have a prediction, right? We can predict approximately what we expect for ambient noise at night. So that's what that green, that smooth green line is, right? That's our best guess of what we should expect when it comes to, to, you know, to noise at night. Now, there's an interesting problem with noise and audio. There are three things that affect ambient noise levels. One is what the temperature is, what the humidity is, and what the air pressure is. So on any given night, actually, our expected noise level at our, at our listening station will be different. And what we expect to be okay will be different depending on those three factors. And so in fact, we have to actually compensate for that every single night. We have to make a best guess as to what our expected level should be given the current night and the current environmental conditions. So you can see that actually I mean, there's a fairly significant variation from night to night about what we expect to see. And that's what that green line is there. The various little green hues of the expected values. And so once we've done that, then we can apply a, uh, a, an alarm criteria. And so again, you're experimenting, trying to come up with an algorithm for how do we decide when there's an alarm? When do we call somebody and say, hey, wait, there's something weird going on. And so again, you can see that in most, on, on most occasions, right, we occasionally get this, a transient, but on most nights, are, 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 we don't get any false positives. But in the cases where we really do some, have something significant happen, we do get a very solid indication of it. <laughs> and so, yeah, so uh, this is a project that is still in progress. And, um, and so our, one of the things on our to-do list is to find out what happened on September 10th. Because obviously something interesting happened. So let's take a quick a, a quick side trip though into um, here's a quick one. Um, so let's take a quick side trip into median filters because one of the things we found about environmental sensing is that median filters are your best friend. So here's a data from a single line. So raw data, it's pretty messy, um, but you can see a few trends in it. But there's a lot of little spikes. In if I do a median filter on that with a 15 minute window, one of the things that happens is it does immediately eliminate any events that were less than seven minutes long. Whether you want that or not, it's up to you, but you have to set the filter values the way you want it. In our case, we felt that a seven minute event was probably too short for us to pay attention to. However, the nice thing about median filters is that they do show, they keep the events that are longer than the window that you're interested in. So you can see in a couple of cases where the, the data follows the trend very nicely when certain transient events happen. This is a, a technique that's used very heavily in industrial automation because it shows level changes. It does not filter them out. But there's an, a, a change in the ambient levels. Contrast that with a mean filter, which is just simple averaging, and you'll find two things happen. One is that your data is lagged, right? You can see the red line lags the blue line pretty significantly. Um, and also, it tends to uh, it tends to smooth out both the highs and the lows. So both the the transients that you're interested in get filtered, get get smoothed out, and your um, and, and any spikes get counted get counted against you as well. So things to think about when you're doing exploratory analysis: the median filter is your friend. Um, Almost certainly you haven't seen all the scenarios until you have captured a lot of data. You should always consider how you're going to turn this into online analytics that you're doing this, right? If you choose techniques that require that you see the entire night's worth of data, 
that won't help you all that much if you're trying to do it alone. You need to pilot all your online analytics because if you have a single false alarm, it will destroy the trust of your customers or whoever you're down to be receivers of. So our last, our last part of the tour is to talk about online analytics and time prediction. So now we're in the data aggregator. We're doing online analytics type stuff. In this case, we're trying to do, we're trying to actually monitor ties. And I know you're going to say, ties. Didn't the Phoenicians figure this out in about 500 BCE? Um, it turns out they did. Um, there are 23 different factors that feed into merely the astronomical values for, uh, for times. And you can spend a lot of time learning about this if you want to. But not only that, it depends on the weather and it depends on the geography as well. So um, if you think the times are simple, you'll discover you're not. They're not if you'd like to spend time learning more about times. Um, and so what we did was we're, we built a time meter built a time meter um, that's monitoring a specific bay. And it's an ultrasonic sensor that's using an Arduino and an ultrasonic sensor to measure the distance from the hydro piling down to the surface of the water. Um, but there's a couple of complications, of course. So it's ultrasonic, and therefore it's subject to temperature, right? Sound, the speed of sound changes depending on what the temperature is. It changes pretty significantly. And the other problem is that if you're in a rural area with an ultrasonic uh, sensor, you will attract bats because well, they, they can hear you. <laughs> and so you discover all sorts of weird transients in your data from the bats flying through the beam. So, uh, so we have to do some feedback. This all happens at the edge node and sends all that data up to things. But up at things and in the, in the data aggregator, we do some further analysis. We actually do a second median filter over the long, over a longer term. Um, we have um, additional temperature compensation that's taking advantage of a little bit more history. Typically, edge nodes don't tend to have a lot of sense of history. The goal for those devices is to keep them as simple as you can. And usually, they don't have a whole lot of memory available to them. So usually, they can't do a lot of historical type analysis. They usually are sort of focused on the here and now. Um, you know, a minute is a long time to an embedded system. Um, so uh, the other thing it does is it converts it to water depth because we're actually measuring the distance to the water, not the actual depth of the water. And um, it's also got a system for tweeting. It actually sends out a tweet every time that the that the that, that it crosses a particular threshold. We also have uh, history system state machines in the system so that we don't keep tweeting uh, over and over again. So we only send out one tweet every time. And so you can see the tweets at the top there. Um, and also you can see the live analysis, the live current level in Aqua Bay, uh, which is down on the, on the cave. Um, just about. So I want to thank you, especially given that it is 4.30 on Sunday on a beautiful day. You, you all get the badge of honor. You're a true data scientist. Um, um, like I said, if you collect the data but you don't analyze it, that's negative ROI. Cost you money and you can get anything out of it. Analysis happens at every stage in the IoT system. Okay, so don't get caught up in the fact it's all going to be in the cloud or it's all going to be down at the edge node. Um, online analytics are take a lot of data to get them right. And you got to do a lot of testing. Um, and because if you don't get a lot, if you don't do a lot of testing in your online analytics, you'll quickly lose trust. Um, meaning filtering is your friend. And if you want to learn more, you can get this presentation from slides.com.